This is amazing. So here in Luke chapter 24, what does it say? And behold, on that very day, what day? The resurrection day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, which was 60 stadia from Jerusalem. What's 60 stadia? Well, it's about seven miles and it takes about uh, two and a half, two hours. And they're walking on their way to that village from Jerusalem to Emmaus. Here's a map to show you, right? Here's Jerusalem, the old city. If you went this far, you would be right about where Emmaus could be. Nobody knows exactly where it is, but it's interesting. So here's Jerusalem. They're walking along and Jesus himself approached and began traveling with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are these words that you are exchanging with one another as you are walking? And they came to a stop looking sad. One of them, named Cleopas, answered and said to him. So they stopped. They looked sad. One of them says to him, Are you possibly the only one living near Jerusalem who does not know about the things that happen in these days? And he said to them, What sort of things? (laughs) Yes, my friend. Yes, God has a sense of humor. I love that, don't you? So he's in disguise. He doesn't even let them know who he is. And he says, what are you guys talking about? What sort of things happened the last three days here? I just love that. I love that the fact that God has a sense of humor. It's just, it's really cool. All right. Let's continue on. And they said to him, those about Jesus, the Nazarene, who proved to be a prophet, mighty in deed and word in the sight of God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and crucified him. That's why they're sad. But we were hoping that that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all of it, all of this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Now Jesus may have said, Oh, he may in his mind, right? <laughs> Back to that sense of humor thing. But That's what we're seeing here, this scene. It's amazing. But also some of the women among us left us bewildered when they were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find his body. They came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Oy vey, guys. And so some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just exactly as the women had said, but they did not see, but him they did not see. Jesus again would be like, Oy vey, three days. The women saw him. They saw angels that said he was alive, right? And then he said to them, You foolish men. So now he's about to rebuke them. Now, I, I'm joking here. You know, we weren't in that scenario. They didn't have the rest of the book, you guys. Um, we probably would have been just as scared or probably a lot more scared than these guys were and sad about the whole thing, right? Um, we didn't have, they didn't have the book. They didn't have the New Testament, but Jesus did tell them he was going to be, he was going to die and three days rise again, but they forgot about that. And now Jesus is rebuking them to remind them of what he himself said while he's still in disguise here. So that's what's happening, guys. Pretty cool stuff. All right, let's get back into the scripture, Luke 24. And he said to them, you foolish men, slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets had spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ, which just means Messiah in the Greek, to suffer these things and to come into his glory? And then beginning it with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them, right? He explained to them what? The things written about himself, himself in what? All the scriptures. And where did he start? In the book of Moses. That's the beginning of the Bible, right? So here's the Tanakh. This is the Jewish Old Testament. They call it the Tanakh. Why? Because the TA stands for the Torah, which is the first five books of the Bible written by Moses, sometimes called the Law of Moses, right? And then the Navim, the NA of the Tanakh, the Navim, which is the prophets. And that starts with Joshua, Judges, Samuel, Kings. And then uh, the, those are the former prophets and the latter prophets. 
prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and then the 12, which are like Joel and uh, the many more, right? So then there's the Ketuvim. The Ketuvim is the K-H of the Tanakh. And that's the writings, the Psalms, the Proverbs, Job, Song of Solomon's, Ruth, Lamentations, Ecclesiastes, Esther, Daniel. I don't know why Daniel's in there. It seems like it should, he should be over here, but Daniel, uh, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Chronicles. That's what we see. This is the Jewish Old Testament, which is called the Tanakh. So back to Luke 24. Then beginning with Moses, remember, beginning with Moses, written about himself, all the things in the scriptures. He's telling them all about himself and all the scriptures. And they approached the village, right, on this walk, where they were going. And so they strongly urged him saying, stay with us. I'll bet they did. I bet this is the most amazing teaching they had ever heard, right? They were like, whoa, they were blown away by this teaching. And you should be too. And that's why I love going through the Old Testament and finding Jesus in it, because it should make your heart burn with joy in you. And, and you should want to be with Jesus more as you see him in these scriptures. So that's, that's what we're seeing here, you guys. So let's go into it some more. So he went in to stay with them. They invited him. He went in, right? That's how it works. And it came about when he had reclined at the table with them that he took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it and began giving it to them. So here Jesus broke the bread and he blessed it and he gave it to them. And then their eyes were open and they recognized him. Do you recognize him, my friend? Do you see Jesus in this, in the Old Testament? If you're Jewish in, in Israel, do you see him in the Tanakh? We are going to in this episode. He broke the bread and they recognized him. Was it because they saw the nail-pierced hands? Maybe. Or maybe it was just supernatural. They saw that it was Jesus now. But that's the thing. That's the question. Do you recognize him? You want to recognize him. He's the only one who can save you. All right, so it continues here. And this was resurrection day. He's alive. They realize now, they're finally realized he's alive. <laughs> they're excited. They see Jesus. Not only do you give him the greatest teaching ever, but they realize he's alive. So what did they do? They rush back to the other disciples. That's what happened, you guys. He's alive. His nail-pierced hands are reaching out to you as well, my friend. So then Luke 2, 24 continues, and he vanished right out of their sight suddenly. And they said to one another, were our hearts not burning within us? Our hearts were burning like a good burning, the filling of the Holy Spirit, you guys. God's love burning in your heart. When he was speaking to us on the road while he was explaining the scriptures to us. So their hearts were just filled with God's love as Jesus was teaching them where he was found in all of the scriptures. It's like a flame in a candle. When that flame is in your heart, you feel warmness in your chest and it's like wax. The wax is becoming soft, right? Not cold, like a, a candle that's not lit, cold and brittle and uh, cold and no light, right? But when that's lit, it's soft. Your heart is soft. And here's an oil lamp. When your lamp is filled with oil, in other words, the Holy Spirit, he's the olive oil that's filled up in your lamp that gives you light and peace and warmth, you guys. That's a picture of God. So the Tanakh, here it is again. So we see the Torah. This is the first five books of the Bible written by Moses, right? And we're going to start here in Genesis. And I'm sure that's where Jesus started, right? But perhaps Jesus just took him to the very first word, Bereshit, right here, Bereshit, Bereshit in, in Hebrew. And it's here it is in English. And each one of these letters actually tells a story, especially in the ancient Hebrew. The Paleo ancient Hebrew were actually symbols and pictures of things, just like all languages, right? So it's the first word of the Bible. What do we see in the first word of the Bible? We see Jesus. We see the gospel, the good news. Here it is. Look at this. I'll put it on the full screen so you can see it, you guys. So here we go. Full screen. Right here is the very first letter of the Bible, bet, bet, right? And it's a picture of a shelter. Here's the ancient Paleo Hebrew down here in the bottom. This is the modern Hebrew up here. Here's the pronunciation, bet. And it's a structure. Here's the foundation on the top. Here's the roof. And there's somebody in here like, like this is a shelter, right? A dwelling place. Here it's a tent, the ancient Hebrew, it shows a tent, right? And it speaks of the sun. Okay, I, you'll see that in a minute, but watch this. 
So then you have the resh, the resh, and the, and when you pr- pronounce both of these together, that's bar, right? Bar, which is what sun. That's where we get the sun. So the resh means a person. It's a person, and then they basically you take that tent, that dwelling place, and you stand it upright. Here it's a uh, a picture of a person right here. This is the ancient Hebrew guys, and then aleph, the very first letter of the Hebrew Bible, aleph, right, which is God. Okay, because a left speaks of strength and power, and this speaks of God's strength and his power. And then you have sheen, right? Sheen. This is all Bereshit. This means Genesis, too, by the way, where we get the, the name Genesis for the book of Genesis. But sheen speaks of wrath, and it's actually where we get our W. And this W was originally teeth. It was like three teeth. That's why right here in the modern, you see three hooks, and these were like flesh hooks. Hooks, and Jesus was pierced in three places on the cross. So here you see it's, it speaks of God's wrath destroyed. And then here you have the yod. The yod is a small symbol right here. And it speaks of God's hand. And it's also how you pronounce Yeshua, the yod, God's hand. And then the last word, breshit, of uh, the word where we get Genesis, right? is tav it's the tav this is the modern hebrew for the tav but the ancient hebrew it was always a cross right here a cross and it was a sign a covenant a symbol of ownership that's what it meant in ancient times and they used this cross even in ezekiel's time this was what was used the tav so when you spell it all out the very first word of the bible which is genesis just means in beginning right that's what it means in beginning but the symbols mean this the sun the sun right the son of what god he was destroyed god's wrath he was destroyed by his own hand at the cross which was a sign a covenant and a symbol of ownership is that not amazing you guys god is so good to give us that god did that he put that in there the very first word of the bible wow so so awesome take a look at that again one more time isn't that great isn't that amazing that god did that I just love that, don't you? It's so good. So Genesis 3, let's continue on in the very first book of the Bible. Perhaps Jesus did this on that road to Emmaus. He shall bruise you on the head, God speaking to Satan. Remember, they just sinned. They just took of that fruit they were not supposed to, Adam and Eve. And God speaking to them and the serpent, Satan, he's there too. And he, and he says to Satan specifically, he the, the seed of the woman, he said, right? The seed of this woman, he, speaking of Jesus, shall bruise your bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel, right? That speaks of the, uh, the cross. Why do I say that? Because a bruised heel is where you would see bruising when someone dies upright it's called lividity this is a medical term this is how they study they research they do investigations they can tell the position that somebody died in by where the bruising in there would be bruising on your side if you died on your side if you died upright on a cross there would be bruising on the heel because the blood pools up down there and it becomes bruising so isn't that interesting that satan right let's go back to to this he's bruised on his head He's getting tossed down, I think, head first down into the lake of fire. He's going down. Jesus died upright. Okay, <laughs> just, just a little quick uh, thing there that you can look at. So, lividity. And then later in Genesis 8, 4, when we're looking at Jesus probably went, you know, in this chronological order, I would imagine, because God does things in order. So Genesis 8, 4, then we see Moses' story. Not Moses, Joseph, uh, sorry. <laughs> I've got all these guys in my mind right now. Noah's story. Noah, he was also a type of Christ and his story was too. So then in the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, the ark rested. When was this? This was the very day that Jesus was talking to those two guys on that road to Emmaus, resurrection day, three days after Passover, my friend, it was the 17th day of the seventh month because God has that seventh month changed to the first month in Moses' story. But it was the 17th day, which is three days after the 14th day, which was Passover, you guys. 
the day that Jesus was crucified. Wow. That's when the ark rested. Rested upon the mountains of what? Ararat, the Bible says. And what does Ararat mean? Curse is reversed. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? Oh my, I'm sure Jesus brought those guys through this. And then later we see in Genesis 22, we see Abraham and Isaac going up the mountain. And God says to Abraham, take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah. Was he his only son? No. Why did God say take your only son? Because he's showing us the cross. He's showing us his plan with his only son. Take now your son, your only son. No, he had two sons. Ishmael was his other son, but Isaac was the son of the promise. So your only son, no, whom you love. Did you know that this is the first mention of love in the Bible? Isn't that amazing? That means you need to pay attention to that. And he said, God said to him, go to the land of Moriah, to Abraham and Isaac, or to Abraham. He said this, so Moriah, where's that? Moriah, Mount Moriah is the very place of Jerusalem, you guys. Here's an old map that shows that. It's the very place of Jerusalem. That's Mount Moriah, where Jesus was crucified. Wow. So now we can look at Joseph's story. I would imagine Jesus took him right into that. He probably went into Jacob as well, I'm sure. But we're going to look at Joseph right here. And we're going to see something amazing in Joseph's story, you guys. In Genesis 37 through 50, that's where we see Joseph's story. And he was a huge picture and a type of Jesus Christ. Here it is. Real quickly, we're going to do this fast. I'll do the full presentations. You can see all of it. So he was the father's most favored son. We see that in Genesis chapter 37, right? Joseph, the father's most favorite son, he was despised and rejected by his own. Remember, his brothers hated him and despised him. They conspired to murder him. Remember, he was sold for pieces of silver. Judah came up with that plan to sell him for pieces of silver. And that's where we get the name Judas derives from the name Judah. And he was handed over to the Gentiles. Remember, his brothers handed him over to the Gentiles. And then later, he was falsely accused and he was sent down into that place of the condemned, that dungeon in in Egypt. Remember that? And it was down there, you guys, down there that he tells the fate of the two that were condemned with him. Remember the baker and the the cupbearer and the baker, the cupbearer is redeemed a life. He says that in three days, you will be brought up and, and restored to the king to serve him. The other one was cursed to death, just like the cross, the two on the cross with Jesus. And then later he was raised up. Joseph was raised up out of that place of the condemned. And what happened after that? He was brought before for the throne just like joseph you guys jesus and joseph it was god did this on purpose and he was the only one found worthy to reveal god's plan right just like what the book of revelation where we see jesus in chapter 5 of revelation standing before the throne john sees him and he wept because no one was found worthy to take the scrolls out of the right hand of he who sat on the throne and then the elder tells him don't weep behold the lion of the tribe of judah has been found worthy and then he sees a lamb as if he had been slain taking the scrolls out of the right hand of he who sat on the throne Just like Joseph, Joseph was the only one in all of the land found worthy to reveal that that God-given dream that was given to Pharaoh about the future, about what was going to take place in the future, a time of great harvest, and then a time of great, a seven-year time of great trouble. And that's when who gets saved? Israel. You know what's amazing, you guys, is God put one-fourth or 25% of the book of Genesis, the very book of beginnings about all these amazing stories. But one fourth of that is dedicated to this one man, Joseph. That would be like you taking your four-year degree, getting your four-year degree in, in ancient history, but then spending one whole year, your final year, last year on one man. And then in this case, it is. It's Joseph. God did that. This, the school that God has for you. So let's get back into that presentation on Joseph. This is amazing, you guys. So he was the only one found worthy to reveal God's plan. And then he was made 
the right hand man to the power. He was given that signet ring. This is a picture of an actual ancient Egyptian signet ring. Maybe it was Joseph's. We don't know. But he was given that power and all had to bow the knee to him. Remember that? And then what happens? He who sat on the throne gave him his Gentile bride, Asenath. Isn't that amazing, you guys? Joseph and Jesus. Then he has a great harvest, just like Jesus has a great harvest before that seven-year time of great trouble, right? And then what happens? A seven-year time of great trouble, or you could even say Jacob's trouble. And that's when what happens? His brothers come back to him. They're bowed down in fulfillment of those dreams that Joseph had when he was 17 years old, right? On his first visit, when he said they're all going to bow to him. And he reveals to them that he's alive. He's alive. (laughs) He's alive. He says to them, come closer. Don't be afraid. They come closer. And he says, Ani Yosef. That's Hebrew for I am Joseph. I'm alive. And they discover that and they were in shock. But he does what? He shows them great, great mercy and grace. And he saves all of Israel, you guys. And he grafts his new family into his old family as one family forever and ever. Wow. And they live in the best of the land, the best of the land, just like we're going to be in the promised land ourselves, that land that Jesus is preparing right now for you and me, if you're a believer in him. Isn't that amazing, you guys? Joseph's story is so powerful, you guys. I even wrote a book on it. You can check it out on Amazon, Joseph, the Father's Most Favorite Son by George Crabb. You can look it up if you want, but it goes into detail about Joseph's story. You don't want to miss that, but you can watch the videos for free if you want, and you'll get all the same information. I did a whole series on Joseph of on in that playlist how to find jesus in the old testament so let's continue on you guys and now we're going to look at moses moshe if you're in israel moses exodus 1 now a king arose over egypt who did not know joseph he had the hebrew baby boys killed just like who this guy right here herod the not so great harry the horrible So that Pharaoh and this Herod were very similar. And the story of Moses and Jesus are very similar too. Watch this. He had the Hebrew baby boys killed. And then in Stephen's story in Acts chapter 7, just before Stephen gets martyred, right? He was full of the Holy Spirit and he gives the, the, uh, the religious leaders a lesson in Jewish history and in scripture. And it's amazing because this is the New Testament. And Stephen points it out right here. He says, And he, that is Moses, thought that his brothers understood that God was granting them deliverance through him. Deliverance, guys. But they did not understand the first time, right? On the first visit. But the one who was injuring his neighbors pushed him away, saying, Who made you ruler and judge over us? Oh, God did, my friend. God God made Moses ruler over them, but he also made Jesus the ruler. And in John chapter 3, we see this in Moses' story as well, because John uh, Jesus quotes this to Nicodemus, the religious leader, the Pharisee that's visiting him. And he says to him, and just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, he's taking that from the book of Numbers, right? So must the Son of Man be lifted up. There's a picture of Jesus. Jesus is using typology himself. And then John 3 continues, so that everyone who believes will have eternal life in him. Before that, he tells Nicodemus, you need to be born again. You must be born again to be saved. And it's true for you and me as well. And you can have an opportunity to do that at the end of this episode, my friend, at the end of this video, to give your life to Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, if you're in Israel, you can do it. He's a prayer away. You just pray from your heart. You'll have the opportunity. But let's keep going. So to the Tanakh, right? Now we're going to look at the Naveen, the prophets. We're done with Moses, right? Moses did the first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Now we're going to Naveen, the prophets. And this is the order that Jesus actually put it in. In the end of, um, you could see it in the end of Luke 24, that Jesus said it in this order. So we're going to look at Joshua. Joshua is the first of the prophets. His name means Yeshua. The same as Jesus, you guys. It's the same name. So Moses, he represented the law, right? Moses represented the law, the law of Moses, right? 
And Moses could not lead the people into the promised land. But who could? Joshua, Yeshua, he did. He led them in. And his name, Yeshua, means salvation or salvation is of the Lord. So his actual name, Jesus' name, means salvation. Wow, <laughs> that's so amazing. So here's the one that I'm sure you've heard of. Everybody's heard of Isaiah 53. Now, what is amazing about Isaiah 53 is that you could read Isaiah 53 to a Jewish person and they will say to you, often they will say, why are you reading the New Testament to me? And you're like, no, I'm not reading the New Testament. I'm reading the Tanakh to you. I'm reading the prophet Isaiah to you. And then a lot of them, when they hear that, they become Christians, become followers of Jesus. It breaks their heart in a good way. And they, they open their heart to Jesus. So Isaiah 53 says this, but he was pierced for our offenses. He was crushed for our wrongdoings. The punishment for our well-being was laid upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. Wow. Amazing. Now let's get into Jonah. Uh, you might be wondering, like, Jonah? Is that, we're going to see Jesus in Jonah's story? Well, Jesus referenced Jonah himself. Jesus referenced him uh, as a sign of, of him. But you're going to see more in this. Watch this, you guys. Jonah chapter 1. How is it that you are sleeping, the captain said, these guys on the boat said, in this gnarly storm that they're in. This boat was about to sink. How is it that you are sleeping? Get up, call on your God. Perhaps your God will be concerned about us so that he will not, we will not perish. Remember the disciples said the same thing to Jesus when he was sleeping on the boat, right? So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. What else? Where else do we see lots cast when Jesus was on the cross, right? So Jonah was in the stomach of the fish for three days and three nights. Matthew chapter 12, Jesus referenced Jonah. He said, for just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the son of man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And then in Jonah, it continues, Jonah chapter 2, I called out of my distress. Here he is in the belly of the fish, just like Jesus was in the heart of the earth, to the Lord. I called out my distress to the Lord, and he answered me. I called for help from the depth of Sheol. The deep flowed around me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. The deep flowed around me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head, right? This is a picture of the cross. It's a picture of the, the thorn crown pushed down upon Jesus' head as he was on that cross. And this sounds like a lot like, to me anyway, it sounds like Psalm 22. The deep flowed around me, right? This, this, this God's wrath, right? And I descended to the base of the mountains. This is a prayer that Jonah's having in the belly of the fish. The earth with its bars was around me forever. Jesus paid the full price down in Sheol for you and for me, my friend, on that cross, right? So, but you have brought me up my life. But you have brought up my life from the pit, Lord my God. You have brought my life up. Jesus was raised from the dead. And what happened? That fish spat Jonah out on dry land. Jesus came out of that tomb, spat out of that tomb on dry land as well. And Jonah 2 continues, And that which I have vowed, I will pay. Salvation is from the Lord. That's like that name, Yeshua, salvation of the Lord. That which I have vowed, I will pay. That's also in Psalm 22. Jesus paid for all of our sins, guys, and salvation is of the Lord, Yeshua. That's what that means. So isn't that amazing? We looked at the prophets. Now we're going to look at the Ketuvim, the writings, right, of the Tanakh. Here we are, the Ketuvim. We're going to look at the Psalms. I know there's more. There's Proverbs, there's Daniel, there's Ezra, Nehemiah, all that, But we're, and Ruth. Ruth is an amazing story with the picture of Christ in that as well, but we're just, we can't look at all of it. Okay, so we're going to look at Psalms right here. So Psalm 22, and their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And, and that's the wrong scripture. I'm sorry. 
Their eyes were open and they recognized him. That is from Luke 24, right? But Psalm 22, let's look at that right now, you guys. Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Well, Jesus said that from the cross. And why did he say that? He's taking everyone there on the scene to Psalm 22. That's what rabbis did in those days. They pronounced the first sentence or phrase of the the scripture or the verse. And then the, the students would scroll to that verse or that part. There was no chapters back then. So Psalm 22, my God, my God, Jesus cries out on the cross. It's recorded in Luke. Why have you forsaken me? But I am a, later he says, but I am a worm and not a person. That's in Psalm 22, which is prophetic of what Jesus said on the, or was going through on the cross. But I am a worm and not a man. That always struck me weird right there. And let's look at the scripture so you can see it. I'm sorry. But I'm a word. And that worm for worm is tola or tola shani in Hebrew. And not a person. That's that's what it says in that psalm. Well, here is that worm. It's actually more like a grub. And it climbs up these trees in Israel, even today, these oak trees typically. And it climbs up a tree and it goes up at one time in its life to give birth to its offspring and then dies. And it literally sticks to the tree. Forget this. Three days And then it bursts open and all of its young live and they're stained with that same crimson red color for the rest of their lives. Now, this tola was also used to make the dye in ancient Israel, was used in the tabernacle, the veil of the temple, the yarn around the scapegoat, Aaron's garments, right? The high priest's garments. And it was where they got the red dye. So they would collect these off the tree. They would dry them and they'd crush them and make a powder out of them to make that red dye, that tola shani, the crimson red color, right? Well, that little creature also had a life which showed a picture of the cross. This is amazing, you guys. God is so amazing. So here's a picture of the dried uh, little tolas, and there's the powder that they could make out of it, the crimson red powder. They would crush it maybe like this or maybe a little bit different than that, right? So here's a, a stone little bowl of it when it's the dye was crushed in it this is actually something that uh, i've got at my house and i did from a video and we're going to watch the video of it right here so here you can see the the dried little uh tolas the worm of psalm 22 verse 6 i'm a worm that's an i am statement too you guys i am a worm and no man (laughs) What was he speaking of? He was taking you to this little tiny creature that they find in Israel. In fact, the Temple Institute is gathering these today and making the priestly garments for the new temple that's coming. And they discovered this tola. And the professor actually said it's part of the redemptive process for Israel. Isn't that amazing? So here I'm crushing it here, crushing those dried little tolas, tola shenis. And once it's ground up really good, then it makes like a, almost like a powder. And that's when we add water to it. And that's where you're going to see the crimson red color. This is how they did it in ancient Israel, my friend. Pretty amazing stuff, right? So here you can see that color showing through. Now, if we add some water to it, watch what happens. We get the dye, the very dye that they made the priestly garments with, the veil of the temple, the tapestries of the temple, the the red crimson yarn that was tied around the scapegoat, all of those things, you guys. So here it is. Here's that red color from the tola, the worm of Psalm 22, verse 6. Is that not amazing, you guys? So look at the color. It's even turning this red a little bit, that stone um, item that I used to grind the, uh, the tola with. Isn't that amazing, you guys? So awesome. God is so awesome. Here I put a little bit of string in there to show you the scarlet cord, right, that we see. There's a scarlet thread that we see in, in Rahab's story, right, with the spies. And this would also be like the yarn for the scapegoat. And you can see how it dyes it. Isn't that amazing? I love that. Don't you? So Psalm 22, I am a tola and not a person. A disgrace of mankind and despised by the people. How much less man that is a worm. This is Job, you guys. 
And he talks about it too. So how much less man, that is a worm, and this is the word rima, rima in Hebrew, which is more like a gnat. And then he says, and the son of man, who is a worm, and he used the word tola, or tolashani, toloth, right? For the son of man. So for man, that, that gnat, and for the son of man, that toloth. It's just interesting. That's in the book of Job, you guys. Son of man is also used for the Messiah who is the ancient of days that we see in Daniel chapter 7. And then what do we see, guys? This is Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, shani in Hebrew, right? They shall be as white as snow. Though they be as red like crimson, and that word in the Hebrew is toloth or toloth. They shall be as wool, as lamb's wool white as snow you guys speaking of jesus so actually i wrote a book on this if you want to check it out on amazon you can do that the link is in the description below and you can click on that and and purchase this book pretty cheap i think it's around 10 bucks and it goes into detail about that so proverbs 30 also now that we're in the ketuvim uh the writings right we also want to look at this proverbs 30 who has ascended into heaven and descended who has gathered the wind in his fists who has who was who has wrapped the waters in his garment who has established all the ends of the earth what is his name or what or his son's name surely you know surely you know yes his name is jesus yeshua that's who his name is we know that writer of proverbs did not know that <laughs> he didn't know but he says what is his name and what is his son's name there's another picture of jesus in the old testament it's amazing you guys so i did write a book and you can check it out on amazon i'm writing a book excuse me this is still being written right now 2024 and you can pre-order this book on Amazon if you want, but it's going to be in great detail uh, from all of the teachings I've prepared on how to find Jesus in the Old Testament. It's going to go in that Tanakh order, right? In the books of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms and the writings, it's going to go in that order. So I'm excited. I hope you are too about this, uh, this book that you can pre-order on Amazon. But hey, as promised, my friend, if you have never received Jesus, Yeshua HaMashiach, Yeshua the Messiah, Jesus the Messiah, into your life to become a child of God, you can do that right now. He died on the cross for you, my friend. He loves you. Even with all your faults and your sins, He still loves you. He loves me. Even as a believer, we sin still, you guys. We're, we're made clean in the sight of God, but we still mess up. But that that what Jesus did on the cross, He paid for all all of your sins and my sins, but you have to receive him first. And that's done by a prayer, a prayer from your heart to God, confessing Jesus. Would you like to do that? You can do that right now. This could be the greatest moment of your life. You can give your life to Jesus the Messiah right now, my friend. All you have to do is repeat these words after me in this prayer. You are praying to God. This is business between you and God right now. So stop what you're doing and do this prayer. Say this prayer. Repeat the words after me. If that it speaks to your heart, if you'd like to do that. Dear God, I know that I'm a sinner and I'm sorry for my sin. Please forgive me of my sin. I believe that Jesus died on the cross. I believe he shed his blood for me. I believe that he suffered for me to forgive me of my sins to pay for my sin and i also believe that in three days guys three days he was raised from the dead and that he's alive today i choose to follow him as my lord and as my savior thank you for forgiving me thank you for loving me and i pray all this in jesus name Amen. Amen, my friend. You know that all of heaven rejoices over one, one who turns to God, repents. That's what repent means. Turns to God. You have turned to God. You are now a new child of God, a fresh new beginning of new believer. You're a new creation in God's sight. God bless you. Hey, 
amazing. Hey, don't forget, hit this playlist right here and the like button down below and the subscribe button because you won't miss anything. But it's all free content. You can click on this playlist and watch how to find Jesus, how to find Jesus in the Old Testament. And it's all free, my friend. So click on this playlist.